preparation of ethers. For symmetrical ethers, you can do acid catalyzed dehydration of an alcohol. For instance, if you take two equivalents of diethyl ether and you react it with concentrated sulfuric acid and heat, you get diethyl ether or ethoxyethane. It's a three step mechanism. In the first step, the alcohol oxygen is protonated to make an oxonium. So that's just your usual proton transfer. The proton source is hydronium, which is present in large proportion in concentrated acid. And what we've done is create this oxonium or water, which is a good leaving group. This sets the stage for our next step, which is going to be nucleophilic attack at the alpha carbon and loss of that leaving group. So two curved arrows, nuke attack, loss of leaving group. Now we're almost there, but our final product does not have an oxonium, which means we need to get rid of this proton here. What do we use for a base? Well, there's plenty of water in concentrated sulfuric acid. So water molecule does proton transfer, takes it away from the ether, and we've got our diethyl ether. So what if I want to make an asymmetric ether? Like ethyl isopropyl ether. Would it just be a matter of doing acid catalyzed dehydration on a 50-50 mixture of isopropanol and ethanol? Well, you get 50% of the desired product, but you'd also get some undesired products. So just statistically, we could combine this with this two ways. Or we could combine two of these, or we could combine two of these. So 50% of the time, we'd get the desired product. But then 25% of the time, we'd get diisopropyl ether. And 25% of the time, we'd get diethyl ether. Fifty percent just isn't good enough. We can do better. The crucial step of a Williamson ether synthesis, which is the procedure for making an asymmetric ether, is having an alkoxide perform nucleophilic attack on an alkyl halide. So this is SN2. Here is our alkoxide hits the alpha carbon of the alkyl halide and the halogen leaves and we end up with our ether. So, one of the fragments comes from the alkoxide and the other fragment comes from the alkyl halide. So, to make ethyl isopropyl ether you might think we could use isopropoxide and ethyl bromide. And that would certainly work. We get SN2 attack. 
What if we used ethoxide and isopropyl bromide? Well, here's the problem. Ethoxide is also a strong base. And when you react a base with a secondary alkyl halide, you get E2. So we're going to take a beta proton. We'll do proton transfer and loss of the leaving group. we would end up with ethanol and propene. So the Williamson ether synthesis only works with a more substituted alkyl halide, I'm sorry, the more substituted alkoxide and a primary or methyl halide. So to prepare the alkoxide, we'll use an alcohol plus sodium hydride. So we react isopropanol with sodium hydride. The hydride is a strong base, a non-nucleophile. So it does proton transfer, and we get isopropoxide. That's the first step. In the second step, we react that isopropoxide with a primary alkyl halide. Like ethyl bromide. And it does SN2 attack and gives us our desired ether. Here's an exercise. Say you want to make T butyl methyl ether. Systematic name 2 methoxy 2 methyl propane. What alcohol should you use, and what alkyl halide should you use? Pause and answer. Here's my solution. If you haven't figured it out yet, pause it. So, the more substituted half, that comes from the alcohol and the less substituted half comes from the alkyl halide. So we're going to use a methyl halide and our alcohol should be t-butanol. Systematic name 2-methyl-2-propanol. Nope, C is wrong because it has the wrong alkyl halide. We need D. So we'd react our T-butanol with sodium hydride, which would deprotonate it to give us T-butoxide. which we would then react with chloromethane and we do SN2 attack.